Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward today to talking to you because this is a call-in show. Uh, it's all about what you're interested in talking about. Maybe you want to discuss the lawn or the vegetable garden or herb garden. Uh, we don't even talk about houseplants if you want to talk about that today. But uh, let's give you a number so you can write it down and give us a call. It's 845-5689. If you're listening online from outside the area, 979-845-5689. And by email, you can reach me at gardensuccess.tamu.edu. Excuse me, gardensuccess at, dot, at T-A-M-U dot edu. Email has an ad in it. All right, anyway, uh, we're looking forward to talking to you. Uh, we've got a lot of emails. I don't know if we're going to make it to all of them today. We'll certainly give it a good try. Um, I want to talk, first of all, about uh, some of the emails that we had coming in. Beth had a question about um, satsumas. They're going to be planting one, and uh, they have a choice between two varieties, Owari and Miho. Owari is O-W-A-R-I, if you're curious about maybe planting your own Satsuma. Uh, Miho is M-I-H-O. Those are both good good varieties. Uh, Miho and Sito and Owari, uh, there, there are actually a number of Satsumas that, that do well here. There's an, there are some that have Arctic in the name, like Arctic Frost. Uh, that have been um, developed in uh, San Antonio, and then they, they really do well also. One thing about satsumas is they don't require a second variety for pollinating. So you can just plant one and have fruit. Now, if you were planting an apple or really most pears um, and most plums also, uh, you need to be able to have a second variety to pollinate so you can end up with fruit. But not with satsumas. Satsumas, for those of you who aren't familiar, are kind of a baggy-skinned citrus. Uh, if you've seen the little cuties in the grocery store, well, think of something bigger than that, and that's kind of a satsuma. In other words, they're real easy to peel. Uh, they're not completely seedless, but they don't have as many seeds. Again, that can vary a little bit with variety, but um, they're a they're a great fruit. Uh, they're a mandarin type of orange, and uh, they are also uh, one of the hardier options that we have. Probably the hardiest citrus for the Brazos Valley is going to be kumquats. Uh, kumquats uh, grow on a, more of a bush than a tree, uh, but they have very small fruit, size the end of your thumb, really. And um, so cu with kumquats, uh, we can take it down into really colder temperatures, but satsumas probably uh, would take it once they're established. Let's say they've been there three years. They're going to be able to take it down in certainly in the mid mid twenties, maybe down a little bit below that, uh, low to mid twenties, uh, something something like that. Um, but anyway, uh, the satsumas is one of the best uh, choices if you want to be able to grow citrus here in this area. Uh, let's see, we. We uh, just a couple of comments that is do we plant it now or do we plant it uh, wait and plant it uh, like maybe during fruit tree time or some other time of the year fruit tree time time typically being at the end of winter mid to late winter uh, is when a lot of people purchase and plant fruit trees uh, but with with these you can plant them now there's no problem with that now when you pull them out of the container and this is true for any container grown woody plant whether it's a fruit tree 
or a shade tree or some flowering tree or a shrub uh, in your landscape. Uh, they grow in a container and the roots hit the sides and start to go in circles. And they don't unwind underground when you plant them. So you want to cut those roots. And I know it seems horrible to do that, like aren't I killing my plant? And you're not. Uh, you want to cut every circling root. I, I will do it one of two ways. If there's larger roots, just use a hand pruner to cut through them. Uh, if, if there's not larger ones, you can use a box cutter knife, a little one inch blade and slice vertically from top to bottom in about three places going around the, the, the plant. Uh, and then put it in the ground. And uh, there, you can take extra steps even to even help them more, but, but if we could just get people to cut the roots, that would be a great start. And those roots will regrow fast. Within a couple of weeks, you'll start to see uh, some new growth uh, occurring, and that new growth will venture out and help that plant establish well. Uh, and so you want to make sure and cut those roots because uh, the long term of a circling root is not good for the tree or the bush, really. Uh, so uh, that's what I would recommend. I would plant them now. Uh, make sure that they get good water. You know, the best time to plant any woody plant, uh, and mo most of our perennials, is in the fall because the temperatures are cooling off, the demands are going down. If it's deciduous, the leaves are about to fall off anyway if they haven't already. And uh, it's a super low stress time. And our soil is warm in the winter and roots grow when, you know, soils are even down in the 50s. The roots are, there's some root growth that can occur. And so by the time next summer arrives, that plant is so well established. Uh, then midwinter is a good time to plant uh, also. Uh, and then spring is probably, I would say, third on my list. Uh, and then uh, when we get to summer, you can still plant, but you need to be ready to uh, uh, water that plant in smaller waterings more frequently. And, and that's not how we normally recommend you water. You've probably heard me a bunch of times say deep and infrequent when we talk about watering things. Uh, but in this case, think about that plant. It was sitting in a garden center or a nursery and it was getting watered, hopefully, uh, at least once a day, if not twice a day, uh, getting some water and sustaining the big top that's on that little bitty plant. And uh, so when you put it in the ground, even if your soil is reasonably moist, were it an established plant, you wouldn't need to water it. It'd be fine because the soil is adequately moist. But all the roots are in that cylinder. So they pump that cylinder of soil dry, and uh, then they can go into drought stress even though there's moderately moist soil around them. It just doesn't wick in that fast uh, from the side. So you want to water that area. Now you don't want to keep it soggy wet, especially in a clay soil. Uh, if the roots can't get oxygen, that plant's going to get in big trouble quick, especially in the heat when the demands are so high. Uh, but if you if you just give it you know a little bit of a dose, I usually build a berm around anything like that that I'm planting, any woody ornamental or woody uh, fruit plant. Uh, a berm being a little raised donut of soil uh, that goes out beyond the size of whatever that cylinder we've been talking about is. And that way you can fill that up with water, make it about, mm, even if it was just four inches high, that's, that's enough. Uh, and then you fill it with water and all that water soaks straight down. It has nowhere else to go. Uh, when you just use a hose, it runs off, and you think you've wet the soil deeply, but you probably haven't. So uh, a berm is a good other thing that you can do. Just kind of dig down and feel the soil when you're, if you're not sure. Uh, once it gets in the ground, I would, I said water it daily. I'd do that for maybe a couple of weeks, and then try to go to every other day. Uh, maybe go to, uh, to uh, twice a week, and then after maybe a month or so, and, and you're eventually going to wean it off of having to be watered all the time. But the first year is a tough year. It's the touch and go year, and you've spent some money on a nice quality plant like that, whether it's a tree, a shrub, a fruit tree, uh, and so you want to make sure and take care of them. Uh, so that is what I would recommend at this time uh, for that. The phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Uh, going back to the emails, a uh, question, and this is kind of a common thing. Um, let's see. 
Elizabeth uh, has a Chinese pistachio. It's a young tree, but up at the top there's these lanky shoots going straight up, and more than one of them. And the question is, can you prune it? Can you prune those down now? Well, you you can. Uh, we don't normally like to prune trees a lot during the summer. It's better to prune them in the in the dormant season, but uh, you you can do that now because those shoots are all competing to be the main leader of that tree, the, to to kind of be the boss, if you will, taking off up the center. And when when that happens, you often get really narrow branch angles between them. And with the competing leaders, uh, they, they both develop in size. And with the vigor in your tree, that's going to happen pretty fast. So I might go ahead and make the pruning cut now. Another thing you can do is just go out and top maybe, I think there's three of them or so, let's say, let's say there's three, top two of them and let one go on. And by the end of the season, what you're going to see is that one grows in diameter much larger. And then in the winter time, you can go ahead and make the cut all the way back down. Uh, if you want to go about it that way, that's just another option. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, kind of subduing the growth in those other shoots, uh, that, that kind of uh, pr training and pruning. Just know that Chinese pistache makes a nice rounded top tree as it grows up, but when it's young, it is a lanky teenager, and it really uh, kind of doesn't look great uh, when it's at that age, in my opinion. And so, just give it, be patient with it. It will it will continue to grow and and develop into a nice rounded uh, tree. It's one of the one of the few plants we have that I would recommend uh, planting that has. Uh, decent fall color uh, in our area and uh, it you know every plant has its pros and cons it's kind of like people everybody you know they they get their strong points and their weak points and so uh, Chinese pistache certainly has its strong and weak points but, but one of its strong points is is color uh, that uh, in the fall that's helps us way down south here uh, get some of that fall color that they enjoy so easily up in the northeastern US uh, let's see, there was a question from Rachel uh, on email. By the way, our phone number is 845-5689, area code 979-845-5689. Uh, question from Rachel. Uh, they have a uh, neighbor with some plants that are going to be taken out that are currently, I think, serving to help screen uh, a little bit. And the uh, question is, what can we plant to help... Um, you know, re-establish uh, that kind of, of screen because you want to be able to block the view so you're just not exposed uh, to anybody wanting to look across the yard or, uh, you know, see see you and yours. And so I would, you know, the, the problem with screening plants on our modern lots, our modern lots are small. Uh, now, I know some people have giant, you know, acreage and, and estate lots and things, but but the typical neighborhoods that go in, the, the lot lines are, are really small. And so when you think of most of the plants that will get taller, they also get wider. And you end up losing even more of your not as large as you'd like it to be yard. And so that we're looking for things that are more narrow and upright, um, preferably something that's evergreen so the screen continues even into the cool season. Uh, but that is... That is kind of a challenge, you know, to be able to find that kind of plant. Uh, and we, we don't have a lot of great options. There are some hollies that will do that. But here in the Brazos Valley with uh, a lot of clay soils and a lot of higher pH soils, not all, but quite a few, and uh, often water that is super high in sodium and bicarbonates and other things like that, it, it, the holly just is not real happy to be here. Now, you can grow them here. I'm not saying you don't ever plant a holly here, but uh, it's, it's touch and go, especially the first year or two your new holly is going to need. You know, I was talking about that careful watering where we want the soil moist, but we don't want it soggy wet. Uh, holly is going to need that uh, to establish and do well. Once it gets going, it's, it's a pretty good plant to have. But... So what are what are the options? Well, there are a couple of options. One is to use some kind of a panel above the fence that would uh, be able to grow a vine uh, and block the view. Another would be to go with a narrower plant, uh, and there are some upright yopons. A lot of the old varieties kind of, as they got older, they sort of open up and, I say, fall apart, meaning you've got all these shoots going upward, and now you've got a whole limb that just sort of leans way outward and 
and it just sort of opens up. Uh, they, there's one called Scarlet's Peak that looks pretty good right now as far as holding up a little bit better. Uh, it does have berries on it too, which is, I guess, another plus. Uh, and so that would be that would be possibly an option. Um, the other thing to think about is the the view angle. Uh, when you're when you're blocking a view. Uh, even a privacy fence is often enough to block a view if you're talking about somebody standing in one yard looking across to the other yard. Now, if there's a slope and, you know, they're standing higher or whatever, that, that's different. But uh, you don't have to have 12 feet to block most views. Even even 6 or 8 feet in many cases is enough. But if you got a second-story window next door, and again, here go the... Lo the um, uh, small lot lines where uh, it, it's really hard to get something that gets up that high that doesn't take over your whole yard. So, um, Elizabeth, I, I think that would that would be some things to think about uh, as you as you choose a plant for that. Uh, I think that probably the the yopan I mentioned is is probably what I would would use if I were trying to block a view like that. Uh, but I'm willing to think about it a little bit more, and if you'd like to, to call and discuss it more or uh, reply in the email, I'll, I'll be happy to, to visit with you a little bit more about that. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, just some different emails today. I'm going to kind of cover a few things as a group uh, about bees. Uh, they talking about bees and setting fruits and things like that in the yard. And the, the um, uh, plants that have to have cross-pollination or plants that have to have fl uh, bloom uh, pollen taken from a male bloom to a female bloom, like our cucurbits, that would be squash and, and cucumbers and um, um, a lot of the melons like well all the melons the um, cantaloupes musk melons and the watermelons the the bees have to move the pollen even within that plant from the male blooms to the female blooms and as you lose bees uh, that pollination is just not going to happen and it's important and they've even nailed it down to, I think a, on a like a watermelon they need like eight visits by a bee or something to thoroughly uh, pollinate it well because if you think about it every seed in the watermelon is part of what makes that watermelon grow and and develop its size that's true of a lot of fruits if you've had cucumbers before or uh, maybe even some squashes that uh, they weren't shaped normally you know they may be the normal size and part of it and then it sort of shrivels up toward the end that's a poor pollination problem and so you want good bee activity for that in the absence of that you become the bee. Uh, you can get a little artist paintbrush and and paint from one or transfer the pollen from one um, from one um, uh, flower to the other. Uh, that's somewhat tedious, especially when you're getting up every morning to go out and do that. Uh, but depending on how many plants you have, maybe you just have three, let's say three squash plants. Well, that that's not that much time spent uh, with a quick transfer of pollen but you may not be willing to do that but you need the bees to do that and that's one place where a lot of our native bees uh, come in and they really uh, pick up the pick up the slack and, and do a great job there's even a bee called the squash bee that uh, specifically that's what it its job or what it loves to do is deal deal with the blossoms uh, of the squash themselves so uh, some questions about bees and other questions have have centered around uh, supporting bees, supporting pollinators in the garden, what kinds of flowers and bee attracting plants and things like that uh, could be could be used uh, to help with that. Well, uh, I've, there are a lot of different kinds of plants and you can go online and see lists and you know if I started naming them I'd leave out way more than I, I think of to mention but you'll notice there are certain plants out there that the bees are especially fond of and uh, I always like to plant the um, it's a basil African blue basil because it's a very popular one with pollinators uh, but gosh there are so many other kinds of plants uh, that the bees like and they tend to get to working one group of plants and they tend to stay on that group of plants uh, they like to do that. And when you're supporting bees, it's better to have a mass of those 
of those blooms. You know, to have like one bloom in your yard and one bloom in your neighbor's yard is, is not going to cut it. Uh, having plants in masses where there are a lot of blooms and it's dependable and it's worth the bee's trouble to head to your yard and to spend some time working those blooms uh, before it heads back to the hive and then back to your yard. Uh, that's important. So think about it in terms of massing as well because uh, just single flowers here and there aren't as good. And one other thing, uh, there is a difference in bee um, affinity for different kinds of flowers. And again, you can go online. There's there is something called the Xerxes Society. It's uh, X-E-R-C-E-S, I believe is how they spell that. But it's pronounced like it begins with a Z, but it's an X. And it, they do all kinds of stuff about preserving, protecting, supporting bees and things. And they have a lot of good information. But you, you'll you even find lists that say, well, this particular flower is really popular with bumblebees, not so much honeybees, or vice versa. And uh, so I would do a little bit of, of searching, especially when you're looking at shrubs, because, you know, it's easy to put on annual flowers, uh, but if you're picking some shrubs for your for your lawn, that's a long-term investment. And if you are into taking care of the bees, then you would want for sure uh, to pick some shrubs that would that would do that. And we have a lot of good ones. Uh, let's go to the phones. Again, the number 845-5689. And we're going to talk to Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Uh, thank you for your answer about the Chinese pistachio. I yes. really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Today's question is my uh, Texas yellow lantana that's tall and looking very nice. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when that's, the little yellow flowers are about to pop out, they're all starting to get black. Lantana flowers turning black. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have a, a sprinkler that sprays those on a regular basis, That those plants? No, not at all. We have drip irrigation. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to have to think about that. Would you send me a picture uh, e via email uh, up close and good sharp focus of those? Uh, yes, I could, I could do that. Okay. And I am actually coming uh, to a meeting tonight at the Extension office. Okay. But it's after hours. Can I leave a sample of it for you there somehow to retrieve at a later date? Yes. Uh, there's a refrigerator in the meeting room. Put my name on it and stick it in there. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll actually be there. By the way, I should announce that. That's the, the Master Naturalists yeah. are meeting yes. tonight at the AgriLife Extension office, and I'm going to probably stop by if they have any trouble getting in the door. So um, uh, I'll... I'll I, I'll probably stop by there, but but yeah, you can leave it for me there. I can just put put my sample of the lantern in the refrigerator that and put make, your name on it. Make sure it's labeled. Yeah. Yep. And, and if you if you can bring it in a Ziploc or any kind of mm -hmm. closure bag so it doesn't dry out, that's good. Okay. All right. Right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Appreciate bye -bye. the call. Our phone number eight four five five six. 8-9-8-4-5-56-89 or email gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Let's go to the phones now and talk to Dan. Hello, Dan. Hi, Skip. Hi. Uh, I've, got a few, I've got a few questions if you have time, but feel free to check sure. me out anytime. Uh, okay. So I have a easement behind my house where I spread wildflowers. Okay. And they did absolutely fantastic. My question was, when should I plan on cutting them down? I don't want to do it too early because I want to let the seeds ripen. Yeah, well, it depends on the wildflower. The blue bonnets are they're they're casting their seeds now, and so it's it's you know I guess it depends exactly on where your blue bonnets are. But I, as I've walked past blue bonnets, there's a lot of seed pods that have already slung seeds, <laughs> so it'd be okay for them. But uh, typically when we get through our spring wildflowers, then we have a lot of yellow composite wildflowers that show up. And, and uh, you know, you've got Indian paintbrush or Indian blanket, rather, but both of those. So it kind of depends on the wildflower, and your mowing schedule will probably favor the reseeding of one or the other. So if you can't stand to look at the old, dead, dried remains of things that cast their seed early, uh, that that's the management decision, I guess, that you just have to make. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my, my next question is, uh, is there such a thing as a false pomegranate, or is it just that my pomegranates 
I, just drop uh, all their flowers and yeah. never. So what you've got is an ornamental type of pomegranate, and I, I've never heard you know like a term like false pomegranate, but but there are there are fruiting pomegranates which uh, really struggle due to some diseases, uh, the fruit diseases here. But uh, there's the um, uh, ornamental types, and those you wouldn't expect to, to get what everybody thinks of as a pomegranate uh, from them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my next question is about compost. Okay. Uh, the, the little oak worms, I think you called them one time, that come off, I think their actual name is catkins, maybe? Yes. Uh, those are compostable, correct? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And would that be a, a green or a brown? <laughs> Good question. I guess if you got them when they're fresh, it'd be a little more green. So the green and brown thing is is there the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So even in brown stuff, there's some nitrogen. You know, fallen dried leaves even have a little bit of nitrogen in them. Uh, but it's the ratio of it. So I think, you know, if they've kind of dried up and stuff... Um, I would expect that that ratio is changing a little bit. You know, that, Dan, you, I think you've kind of stumped me here because I've never thought about the carbon-nitrogen ratio of pecan and oak and other catkins that are landing all over the place. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's a good one. <laughs> but I just put it, put it in the mix. One thing about composting, Dan, it's, it's going to happen. You know, and if you don't get it just right and all that, don't worry about it. I mean, just the fact that you're taking organic matter and putting it into a moist, warm environment and turning it back into good stuff for the garden, uh, it, it's going to be fine. And my last question, if it's all right, is about cedar trees. Okay. Um, so everyone I know tells me to get rid of the cedar trees at okay. my house. Uh -huh. uh, is that just because some people are allergic? Or I've noticed that nothing grows under them. Like like other trees, I'm able to grow. Yeah, um, ground cover and things like that. Yeah. Um, what do you recommend, or do you buy that? Well, okay. It so uh, we have we have the eastern red cedar, and then as you go over toward Austin, let's say I Interstate 35 area, you you get into the ash juniper, which is which is a very close, very closely related. Uh, plant and they both produce pollen that is wind that's carried on the wind and people have some serious allergy issues uh, some people much much worse than others of course uh, to those plants but y you planting a cedar in your yard is not going to just mean you've you know created this big problem if you ha if you are one who tends toward cedar allergies I wouldn't plant one but I recommend them quite a bit around here because if you drive through the countryside, they're all over the place. We already have cedar, and they're already producing pollen in this area. Uh, it, we just don't have the quantity of it here. And if you live in the country and have a little bit more space, um, they make a really good screening plant. They grow fast. They're native. You can purchase them uh, in bundles, we call them conservation bundles, instead of buying individual buckets at the nursery of plants, which is a more expensive way to buy a plant, you're buying bare root bundles in the winter time and planting the bare roots, and they're so cheap that if a few die, it doesn't matter. And and so people use those as, as wind screens. They use those as um, a, a view blocking element as well. And so I I, I do recommend them for that. But just for the typical yard, probably not so much. Okay. And is it is it a, a thing that um, most ground covers won't grow under that, or is it just probably because it's too much shade? It, it's a combination of shade and, and water, lack of water. Um, and, and so you, that that's kind of the main thing. So I, I don't think you would find them to be, you know, an ideal yard tree. But there's some beautiful cedars around. I don't know if you've, a lot of people around here know about the Kyle House downtown in Bryan, a famous old historical house uh, from the guy that Kyle Fields named after. Uh, and it has a beautiful cedar, at least one, maybe more, uh, out front. And that didn't mean the grass is dead. They're all, because the limbs now are all so high that it, it's not, it's not shading the, the ground uh, in that one spot so much. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's perfect. All right. Well, good luck, Dan. Thank you for the call. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, 
a garden success at tamu dot edu garden success success at tamu dot edu and i have a, a question from rachel with some really good pictures that uh show uh, what looks like a kind of an Italian cypress type of plant. Uh, you know, we have a lot of different kinds of plants that are very similar, like a juniper, cypress uh, type foliage. And these plants often get uh, needle blights or, or foliage blights. Uh, and the little scaly foliage that they have on them, uh, and those kind of plants, when you lose the foliage, it doesn't regreen there. So think, think pine trees are a similar thing. So imagine you had a little pine tree or a little juniper and you pruned back behind the last living needle on a pine, on a branch. You still have the whole branch and everything. You just cut the green needles off the end. That plant would not be able to re-sprout because the living viable buds that can re-sprout are at the base of a needle. So Christmas tree growers can shear their trees, but if they ever shear too deeply, and cut away the, the living green needles, it doesn't come out green again. Now, a lot of trees and shrubs would, would come out green. You can mow them down, chainsaw almost to the ground, they're going to re-sprout. Not cedars and junipers, Italian cypress, those kinds of things. And so with these blights being somewhat prevalent, especially because we do get some rain around here, over 30 inches a year normally, uh, it, it's really a, a plan I don't recommend because the You've, you've grown this big, beautiful columnar plant. In this case, it's, it's the tall, narrow type. And you have a nice long line of them. And then one or two or three uh, lose the foliage in sections, and it just gets ugly. And what do you do? Go plant another little one in there and try to hope it grows up and so it looks normal again? That's not going to happen. So what those are is that's blights. Now, they also get spider mites, and we're starting to see a rise in spider mites. Uh, but looking at the pictures you sent, I can tell you that's, that's not primarily spider mites. That, that's more of, a, of a, a needle blight that's going on. But uh, just a plant that I guess if you were in a Mediterranean villa would be a great choice. Uh, if you're in uh, the Brazos Valley, not so much. Not, not one that I would recommend. Uh, and so even if we were to recommend fungicides and uh, good luck spraying a tree like that, by the way, but even if we could kill all that disease, you still have the dead holes and you're gonna, they're going to stay dead holes for the remainder of the life of that, of that plant. Gosh, it's a bummer to be the bearer of bad news. You know, it, it, I'd rather say, well, here's the magic elixir, and it makes all the makes all the problems go away. Uh, let's see. So, just a couple of comments on emails. Um, if if you can attach photos rather than embed them, it's a little bit better. It's a little easier for me to zoom in uh, on them. I can see the embedded photos, but I can't zoom as as well on those. And uh, so attaching is better. And also, uh, for some reason, the I think it's an Apple format, H-E-I-C dot H-E-I-C. I can't open those on my computer. I don't have the whatever it takes to open those. Uh, so JPEGs, PNGs are all good, but um, uh, I guess I need to get an Apple phone. I can do those. Anyway, our phone number is 845-5689, 845 5689 or by email garden success at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu uh, had a question or no excuse me this isn't a question uh, this is an announcement about uh, an activity that you may be interested in attending and this is called learning at the library it's part of our master gardeners series called learning at the library and it's on saturday may 21st guess when a couple days from now so may 21st 10 a.m at the clara Mounts Library in Bryan. Saturday, 10 a.m., Clara Mounts Library in Bryan. And the topic is going to be drip irrigation for the do-it-yourselfer. Uh, one of our master gardeners, Fred Rapsick, will be demonstrating the best drip irrigation techniques for your garden. Fred works with the DIG, the demonstration idea garden that the master gardeners manage up in North Bryan. And uh, he knows a little bit about irrigation because they, they have a lot of irrigation out there that has to be uh, maintained and developed, taken care of. And so if you'd like to learn, uh, and irrigation is not that hard for a home garden. 
Uh, I, I like to tell people, well, it's like playing with Tinker Toys. Uh, well, A, a lot of people don't remember Tinker Toys, but uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but not much. Uh, once you learn some of the principles and how it works and the basic components, and you can buy those locally, you can mail order those, uh, you can put together your own system if you understand a few of the basics. So here's a free chance. Clara Mounts Library, Saturday 21st, two days from now, 10 a.m. Drip irrigation for the do-it-yourselfer. Well, let's go back to the phones. Again, the number is 845-5689, and we're going to talk to John. Hello, John. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. Hey, I've got a, a real problem with uh, native oranges. I guess they're called trifoliate oranges. Okay. Uh, short, I can't shred them on my mower. I can't get out there. Can't drive anything through there short of bulldozing and maybe Agent Orange. What can I do to get rid of those? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're willing to call in a napalm flyover, it sounds like, John. Yeah, pretty so, much. <laughs> well, um, when you say you can't shred them, you mean they're too big to, to run over? Or well, they've got four-inch thorns on them, so, so they'll thorns. run the, Yeah, okay. Yeah, the thorns are, are vicious on those. Yeah, things. there's n okay, there's not going to be a real great answer for you, but here, here's the thing. You, hmm. You've got to be able to get to the, the plant to spray something on it uh, down low. And if, if there's any way to get in there to do that, uh, you can either cut it off near the ground and treat the stump, or you can treat okay. the base of the, st the stem uh, with a, a, a product. Or actually, the ingredient is called triclopyr. It's T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R, triclopyr. It's found... Similar to reclaim? Uh, it's similar to Remedy. The ranchers really? uh, would okay. buy Remedy to kill brush. It's similar to that. But if you're a home gardener, you can go to the center and find uh, poison ivy, poison oak killer, uh, brush be gone. Those kinds of products have triclopyr in them. And you want to use it in a, in a very strong mix uh, with trunk treatments. If you're just going to spray the sides of the trunk, down, say the bottom foot and foot and a half of trunk, uh, you will mix it with diesel oil and uh, okay. as your carrier because it sticks. You're not going to spray it everywhere. You're just going to get the spray right on the trunk. Anything that's not on the trunk is wasted spray. Uh, oh, okay, so it's not but you can, Yeah, you can also cut them off and just treat the cut stump immediately when it's fresh with, with the triclopyr as well. Uh, but uh, the um, uh, website... Uh, there, there is a series of educational flyers from uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension called Brush Busters. And I doubt that they have trifoliate orange in there. They might, but I doubt it. You're going to find things like mesquite and weasatch right, and I other brush. Deal with that all but the you time, can yeah. learn the principle of how they're they're treating things and the mixes and things that, 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 that they would use for that kind of treatment. So if you just have a few of them, uh, probably not a big deal. If you got a whole lot of them, then that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah, it's uh, I do have quite a bit down in the creek bottoms. The, uh, oh, boy. Okay. I, just, I think I'll probably just have to bulldoze down. I was hoping yeah. the freeze would uh, kill those things back, but they're pretty those tough. oranges are tough. Uh, yeah. Tough well, plants. Well, do, they're small. Do people use those things to to put orange, uh, you know, citrus uh, you know, sprouts on them? I have. They, oh, yeah, they do. The, trifoliate is one of the popular rootstocks for citrus. It's not okay. Not the moat. There, there's, uh, there's a version called... Um, Flying Dragon that's that's popular, and then the, the Sour Orange is the one we typically use. But trifoliate right. is graft-compatible with, I think, most of our citrus, so uh, you ought to be able to. But I don't think you okay. want to go down there and try to graft one of those things. I'm not going to try to do that. It, <laughs> I just, it, it so, so, uh, uh, did well, so well through when it got down to zero that I was, uh, I was amazed that they yes. came back out. So Yeah, anyway. yeah, well... They're tough, and they're reseeding, so it's time to go stop them. And then look around, because there's going to be some little ones that have come up. Oh, there are. Seeds. There, I've the, got a couple of acres of them, actually. Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, you better get ahead on those. But uh, Yeah. But uh, the same, the, it, if that's the case, I think I'd go the ranch version. Uh, you can go to a place, uh, you know, that, that sells that kind of product, like our producers here locally. and. Uh, okay, yeah, and, and get some license, so. get some information on that, yeah, and and take a little bit different approach to it. Okay, great. Thank uh, you very much. All right, John. Thank you. Okay. Uh, back to the phones. The number eight four five 
5689, and we're going to talk to Tad. Hello, Tad. Great show. Thank you. How are you today? Real good. Okay. I uh, sent an email with some photographs. <clears throat> I killed some wa uh, windmill palms last year, and I think it was because of overwatering and not having the proper depth to the the mix and all that, which mm -hmm. uh, I've sent you pictures of what Florida sent me and okay. how to plant these new three-gallon, and there's three of them. And so basically I sent you a watering schedule that I've been following that okay. Florida sent. And I've got brown on one of them and now two of them. And, of course, I don't know if it's overwatering or underwatering. Mm -hmm. Of course, I didn't list the rain days in that watering schedule. Okay. So the pictures, uh, maybe that uh, will give you a better idea of what bad Tad is doing with his black thumb. Well, I don't think your thumb is killing these these plants, Tad. So I, I would. I'm I'm trying to look at the pictures as we talk, and I do see what you're talking about. Uh, I don't know exactly what would be killing them. You know it. The fact that a plant is dying is like, you know, you go to the doctor and say, I don't feel good. Well, there's a whole lot of questions that follow that up to try to get down to the cause. And and so I just that, that dieback, uh, it, when did you say you planted those? Or did you? Yes. Let me let me go back and okay. read the email. Oh, you <laughs> sent it to me in the email? Okay. Yeah. Well, I have trouble walking and chewing gum at the same I know, time. Well, so, me too, yeah. Yeah, I see, I see what you got Let's here. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Uh, March, okay. March 1st. Okay. And then I watered it every second day until the 15th. Okay. Yeah. And every fourth day until I. And, and your soil drains pretty well? Well, um, you know, we got clay here in Quail Run Estate. Okay. And uh, one area, there is at one time a subsurface kind of French drain that mm -hmm. my landscape buddy put in. Yeah. The, in this other area, though, um, the, the first one to turn brown, it faces east, but that's always been um, only great myrtles seem to enjoy that spot. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Lovely well, clay. so the Florida Extension Service has a lot of great stuff on palms uh, and a lot of good information. The The watering schedule that they sent you looks good to me. The, um, you know, palms is... A while ago, I was talking about how when you plant, the best time is in fall and then winter and then spring. With palms, it's summer, uh, and that's the exception. Uh, and so if you heard what I said earlier, anyone listening, and you have a palm tree, ignore that. Think of it this way. A palm tree is really a big grass plant. That it, they're, not, they're not related to your shade trees as much as they're related to your lawn. Uh, and so... Um, Palm trees, it, they do better in, in, in the summertime when you plant them. And I think you're doing everything right. I would just stay on that schedule. Uh, d maybe dig down and feel the soil around them. If you did have some um, you know, heavy clay like you're describing, uh, if you feel moisture, then don't worry about watering it right away. Uh, but uh, I, I think you're doing everything right. So I don't, I don't have anything to tell you to change. Okay, well, my bottom line was now I suspect I'm underwatering them because mm -hmm. of the unusual May heat wave. Right, and, right. And so I was thinking about, um, let's see, what to add a watering per week until the rains start up next week. I don't know. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, palms are pretty resilient plants, and so I, I would... Again, I would I would do the dig down and feel. Uh, yes. One of the most difficult questions for me to answer is how often do I water my plants? Because sun, shade, clay, sand, yep. brand new plant, established plant, uh, you know, it just, the, the variables are so great that any answer I give is going to be wrong as much as it's right. And so I I, I just would. If you're yeah. concerned, I would I would do the field test because yeah. that's just a practical. You okay. know if the soil is wet or not, and so somebody may be watering twice a week, and somebody else may be watering every two weeks. You know, it just yeah. depends. Okay, well that's great advice. <laughs> well, I hope so. We'll find out, right? Right. <laughs> Dad, thank you for the call, and good luck with your palms. Thank you. Great show. Thank you, sir. All right, my goodness. Uh, our phone number eight four five. Five six eight nine eight four five 
5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, let's even go back to the emails and Okay, somebody asked about the irrigation uh, seminar, and I'm going to repeat that real quick. To, uh, Saturday, two days from now, 10 a.m. in the morning at the Clara Mounts Public Library in Bryan. Uh, somebody is driving along and, and needed a, a clarification on exactly where it is. Uh, by the way, if you have garden-related activities in the Bryan College Station or the greater Brazos Valley area or even a little beyond, uh, if you would uh, send them to gardensuccess at tamu.edu, I would be happy to uh, promote uh, things that would be of interest to gardeners. Uh, you know, we don't get involved in promoting commercial uh, things like that, but uh, uh, plant societies, you know, organizations and, and, and whatnot, um, we're happy to, to help promote that. Another thing that you can do is you can go to brazosmg.com. That's our Master Gardeners website. And when you go to the brazosmg.com, easy to remember, there is right on the front page something called Gardening Events. And when you go to Gardening Events, there's a calendar where you can actually see what's going on uh, on the calendar of the upcoming events. And if you go there, what you'll also notice, in addition to our Master Gardeners this Saturday at the library, is next Tuesday is the monthly Master Gardener public education meeting. Now, during COVID, these were internal, but now the doors are open and everyone is welcome uh, to come if you would like. This talk is going to be on toxic plants in our gardens. And this is Tuesday, the 24th of May, next Tuesday, from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, Dr. Travis Mays, who is head of analytical chemistry at the Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab, will talk about toxic plants in our gardens, and you can learn a lot about that. And I know you'll have a lot of questions, because we do get questions on that. Everything from houseplants to landscape plants. Is this going to kill my cat? Is this going to hurt the dog? Is this dangerous to children? Uh, and a lot of a lot of good information, but that's a free program, 7 to 8 p.m. The Brazos County Extension Office. We're at 4153 County Park Court. We have a new office, wonderful office, and it's right by the county tax office. So those of you who pay your taxes, <laughs> you know you should know where we are, because when you pull into the tax office, you've pulled into our parking lot. Uh, so next Tuesday uh, out there, and and you can go to uh, Brazos mg.com and find out more about upcoming gardening events. I try to announce them here on the radio, but uh, there's there's always uh, some that slip by. And today I didn't bring my sheet with me, so I have to go online myself to see what's happening. Uh, our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or email is gardensuccess at tamu. Dot edu garden success at tamu.edu and I want to go to one of the emails really interesting uh, email a uh, Christian is interested in uh, looking into vermiculture as a means of composting and he did a little searching as to what kind of worms do you use for that and came across the European red wiggler wriggler and that is uh, the the worm that you use the red wrigglers that is uh, the composting worm for a bin um, night crawlers and stuff are, are not going to cut it in a bin. But if you want to, if you want to learn how to do that, again, there's plenty of information online. There's a little old book, been around a long time, paperback. You can still find it though, called "Worms Eat My Garbage," and it is it takes you through the whole thing. But there's a lot of good free stuff online too about it. Uh, but you you have to use the red wrigglers for that. Now the question was, uh, it kind of went on into more of a uh, what about worms escaping in the environment uh, you know you may have read that uh, there are some invasive species we even have some new ones that have newly invasive uh, that are kind of moving in and uh, doing a number uh, you know in terms of our, our native species but also uh, really speeding the decomposition of the mulch in forests, the, the ground uh, mulch, the natural mulch that the forest mulched itself with. Uh, and that is a concern. In general, I don't recommend just throwing your fishing worms out. I mean, 
but it's been done for years and it's not like you're going to kill the environment if you do it but in general it's it's better to use a native worms uh, to, to have our native worms and, and stuff around um, your activity on that though really isn't going to change much and if you if you went i can't remember the names of the ones that have moved into some of some forests in some parts of the country not here yet to my knowledge um, but I wouldn't bring those down here, uh, for example. But you know, as far as fish and worms are concerned, I, I would just bring them home. I wouldn't wouldn't leave them. But not a, not a huge uh, different uh, either way. But but do watch out for all the other species because you just you just don't want to you don't want to contribute to the problem. If you've never tried vermicomposting before, uh, it's worth a try. Uh, it I say try, it's worth doing. It's not hard. You actually take newsprint, for example, and you tear it into little strips and wet it and put it in a bin. And then you bury your food scraps in that. And these worms just go to town. And there's some food scraps they love. I mean, they they love bananas. It's your favorite. Uh, not so much citrus, but uh, depending on the food scraps you're burying, this is not meat and oils and things. This is vegetable-related food scraps. They just turn it into worm castings. You can buy special bins for doing it. You, I just use a big old Rubbermaid type bin, uh, one that's not clear, uh, so it blocks the light uh, from going in. Uh, there's a few other uh, tricks uh, and things you want to do. Uh, you don't want to keep it too wet and whatnot, but it's pretty fun. Uh, I knew a gardener one time who got so excited about it. Uh, they went on vacation, and uh, when they came back, um, the the spouse told me, "Do you know that uh, that?" person <laughs> I'm trying to avoid saying if it was the the husband or the wife uh, that that person put the worm bin in the in the Winnebago up front in between the two front seats and the, the worms went with us on vacation I guess that's being dedicated to your worms but anyway gardeners do some <laughs> interesting interesting things but vermiculture is kind of cool. And if you got kids, you ought to, you ought to do that because that's especially. Kids need to get involved with all kinds of squishies and, and creepy crawlies and plants and, and whatnot. All right, let's go back to the phones. Our number, 845-5689. Probably have time for one more call. Uh, but we're going to talk now to David. Hello, David. Howdy. Howdy. Um, I've got a little experiment that I hope was not a mistake. started last week. Okay. Um, so I grabbed a couple of worms out of the backyard near, you know, some mulch, and I put them in the pots of some indoor plants here. Okay. Um, so I, what I thought was there's, a, there's some gnats flying around these plants and some, mm -hmm. some dead foliage that maybe uh, is not really getting access by any bugs. So I okay. thought if I help them decompose, then, I'll, then I won't have top top living flies that want to come after the stuff. There you go. Stuff. Is it a bad idea? Uh, well, let me just say it's not going to work. Um, the, it's not a bad idea. It's a fun idea. But you're probably going to find some dried worms on the floor at some part where they came crawling out of there and then they, you know, ended up desiccating. Um, but depending on the kind of worm, you know, night crawlers like to go down deep and they do their burrowing and they love a cool environment, a very cool environment. They don't survive well in a worm bin and the temperatures that, that we have, like in a room temperature uh, and uh, uh, certainly not outside, even in the shade. Uh, but the, the red wigglers can survive that. I don't know if that's what you would have ended up bringing in, but if it was, it, it can take the temperatures but there's just not a lot to eat there. And so oh, okay. the little bit of stuff that they may have, it would be better if you're interested in the worms to, to do a vermiculture bin uh, and try that. Um, now, I have had outdoor pots that ended up with some little worms in them. Uh, I guess maybe, I don't know, some garden soil came in. Maybe a few worm eggs. By the way, worms do have eggs. Uh, and Or the equivalent. And uh, they... When I turned them over, I found a worm in the bottom. But that, that is not something I would expect to be an ongoing um, survival location for those worms. All right. Thank you so much. Well, all right. Hey, thanks for the call. I love the unusual uh, new angles on things. So I appreciate that. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, let's see. Well, let's talk a little bit about some things going on out and about. So it's actually getting kind of hot out there. We're seeing an increase in spider mite activity, at least I am in my gardens. 
And uh, so spider mites like a dry, dusty, hot leaf surface. That's their, that's spider mite heaven. They get underneath the leaves primarily where they're protected from the sunlight. And uh, they uh, take the juices out of your plant leaves and, and they start to get little speckles. And then eventually they even turn brown. When they're really bad, you may even see some webbing. Um, on on the, the very fine webbing. I'm not talking about a big spider web out in out in the air. I mean just right on over the surface of the leaf or connecting between two narrow uh, close plant parts. Maybe a little bit of webbing. The easiest way to deal with spider mites is just to blast them off. Get you a water blaster of whatever kind you have, and just spraying upward from underneath. Just blast them off, and you can if you do that once in a while, uh, you can keep them in bay. I had a a Brugmansia, angel's trumpet, last year that they spider mites love that. They also, uh, by the way, love your um, uh, pin, uh, uh, pinto beans or uh, green beans or pole beans. Those kind of things they love. They they love marigolds. They love uh, tomatoes and a lot of other things. I probably for three days trying to list all the things mites will get on. But anyway, spraying them off is easy. Uh, insecticidal soap sprays work well. I would do it very, very early in the day when it's cool and use a store-bought soap. There's always people talking about home remedy, you know, ivory liquid with such and such percent and so on. You can kill mites that way. You can also burn plants that way. Uh, and so it's better to just use a store-bought insecticidal soap. It's designed, the fatty acid chain length is designed to not hurt your plants but to hurt the pests and so that's what I recommend but still don't do it when it's 100 degrees out, outside and the sun is baking down uh, but the mite, the mites I just blast mine with water I don't know I'm too lazy to get up and go mix up soap and spray it maybe uh, but it works pretty good and you're not going to get rid of all of them. We don't eradicate anything out there. We just keep the numbers down enough to where we get the produce or the flowers or whatever we're looking for out of those plants. So watch out for spider mites. They're out and about. It's time to pull out most of the cool season things if, if they're not already gone already. Uh, my spinach is already bolting. I just need to get home and, and clean it out because it's time to put in the summer things like black-eyed peas and purple hull peas and crowder peas. Um, okra loves to go in this time of the year. Uh, you can still plant some melons, uh, and they'll do okay. We're getting a little bit later, but they'll do okay. Uh, and uh, let's see, there's some other warm season greens that we can plant. Maybe next week on the show, I'll talk about more some of the warm season greens. I'm trying some experiments this, this year with a lot of things that I've never heard of or grown before. Um, a lot of times, you know, we think of summer as a time when we can't grow anything, but there are climates, Southeast Asia, Africa, there's a lot of places where there are plants that are grown in a climate that's hot and humid and muggy and miserable like, like we can be in the summer. And if you're willing to stretch your palate a little bit, there's a few more ideas for edibles that can carry you through the summertime. So maybe we'll talk about that next week. I appreciate you listening to the show today. We're here every Thursday. Please tell your friends to listen to Garden Success, KAMU. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.